Welcome to another evening lecture with Francis Tavern Museum. My name is Sarah Nisha. I am the Education and Public Programs Manager here. As a reminder, tonight's lecture is being recorded. So if you want to watch it again or share it with someone who wasn't able to be here, this link um, will be sent to you in the next few days. You can also see all of our past lectures on our website, francistavernmuseum.org. Remember, if you have any questions during the lecture, please leave them in the Q&A box or the chat. We will try to get to as many questions as we can, but we do get a lot. So make sure you put it in there as soon as you think of it. And as always, the views of the speakers are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Sons of the Revolution in the state of New York Incorporated or its Francis Tavern Museum. And let me introduce tonight's speaker. Roger McCormick, Director of Education at the Bronx County Historical Society, is a writer, lecturer, tour guide, and authority on New York City and Bronx history. So I am now going to turn it over to you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I, my subject tonight is the Bronx during the American Revolution. And I have to admit at the outset that I've kind of lured you all here under false pretenses. Uh, the Bronx as its own entity doesn't exist until the 19th century. But what is today the Bronx is the subject of this uh, lecture. Um, so in the 18th century, um, the Bronx, it was then part of Westchester County. It was divided up into a number of small villages, uh, West Farms Village, uh, Fordham, Westchester Village over here to the, to the east on Westchester Square. And it was largely the province of large landowners. And it was not urban at the time. Um, it was made up of farmland um, and it was very, in a very good location. Uh, it's right next to the Boston Post Road, which you can see on this map, which was one of the only roads that went into New England at the time, and also right next to the Albany Post Road, and the only land crossing uh, into Manhattan, fr from Manhattan into the mainland was, was here uh, called the Kings Bridge, uh, in what is today Marble Hill. Uh, it connected Marble Hill to Inwood. Um, and so, if you were a farmer here, a large landowner it was an excellent area to be able to ship your crops, your dairy products and various things. So the Morris family are one of these large estate owners in the South here in the, in the South Bronx where you see Morrisania. Um, another large landowner is the Delancey family um, that owned uh, what, what today is called Bronx Park where the Bronx Zoo is uh, and, the, and the New York Botanical Garden. Um, yet another landowner is the Phillipses, who owned uh, land in what today Spite and Dival. And uh, in, in Westchester Village, you also have a, a famous family by the name of Ferris. So the American Revolution is about to explode into this pastoral and a very bucolic society. Um, so we'll come back to this map because it's very significant. It shows um, all the forts that were that were. They were put in place along the Harlem River and smaller forts to, uh, to, to protect the approach to the Kingsbridge along the Boston Post Road, um, which is close to where today's Gun Hill Road is. So here is Lewis Morris. He was the signer of the Declaration of Independence. He owned the estate, as I mentioned, called Morrisania, and he was one of these large landowners. And he was a delegate to the uh, Continental Congress where the, in 1776, where the Declaration of Independence was adopted. And also at the content of Congress, um, they agree that the, the, the approaches to the Kingsbridge have to be defended. So they build all these forts along the Harlem River um, and they're numbered forts. So you see here, Fort Number Six, Fort Number Seven, Fort Number Five, uh, Fort Independence uh, by today's Sedgwick Avenue and Giles Place. And here, uh, Fort Number One, Two, and Three, um, in by Spite and Dival, and the Kingsbridge is right here. Uh, and here is uh, it's one of the smaller forts. It was it was given the name of Negro Fort because it was manned by uh, black soldiers in British pay from Virginia, um, and that was along the Boston Post Road. Today, it's uh, it, it would be located on Van Cortlandt Avenue East, and the Grand Concourse. Uh, so back to Lewis Morris, as I said, he was a delegate and his family is very prominent. His brother, Governor Morris, um, was also a very prominent statesman at this time, a founding father. 
um, and known as the penman of the Constitution uh, for drafting the Constitution in the form we know it, we, we read it in today. Um, and it, the Morris family is very interesting because you, you see this, um, the, the, the revolution really divides people and Morris, uh, the Morris family, uh, Lewis Morris and Governor Morris are revolutionaries, but their brother Richard Morris uh, is a Tory and Governor Morris's mother, uh, Sarah Morris, uh, is, stays loyal to the, to the crown. And the Kingsbridge is called the Kingsbridge because everyone had to pay a toll unless they were a soldier serving the crown. Um, and it became very expensive um, to cross it. It was the George Washington Bridge of its time, I suppose you could say. Um, so a, a farmer by the name of Benjamin Palmer um, came up with the idea of having you know, a smaller bridge uh, just south of Kingsbridge here uh, called the Farmer's Free Bridge where you wouldn't have to pay a toll. Uh, and here is the, the historic Kings Bridge from the Revolutionary War. Um, it, 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 it existed until 1914. And this, is, this photograph is from the late uh, 1800s from the 19th century. Um, and it wasn't until, here's another, a slightly better one. You can see Spindle Creek here. Um, and it, it, you, you can see it's very small, a wooden bridge. Um, it doesn't look like much, but unfortunately, uh, Spitendival Creek was filled in, and you see here, this is a year before Spitendival Creek was in, was filled in uh, as, a, as a result, bearing the bridge. Um, and you can see here, they're paving over it with stones. Great, a great tragedy of, uh, of, our, of our history. So the Battle of Pell's Point is perhaps one of the most significant battles in the Revolutionary War. And it's usually kind of talked about in kind of a derogatory way by some historians. They refer to it as just a skirmish, but really um, it's, it's very significant. So the idea, the, the idea that the British army had under General William Howe uh, and the Admiral Lord Richard Howe was to sail up along Long Island Sound and land on what is today the East Bronx and invade and um, encircle Washington's army and trap him in Manhattan Island, thereby ending the war. Because really, if you couldn't get off of, uh, if, if Washington couldn't have escaped Manhattan Island, he would have been trapped in the city uh, with, his, with his army, which is, of course was vastly smaller than the British army. Um, and the Americans, of course, were greatly outmatched, particularly with naval power. Um, and when Washington saw the, or saw the, the size of the, of the naval land in New York Bay and, and then in Staten Island, he knew that, um, New York Harbor, pardon me, he knew that um, he, had to, uh, he had to beat a retreat and continue fighting the war um, from the mainland. And the idea too was that um, this, this area in the Bronx was so strategic because anyone that had to control the city and occupy the country and the mainland as well basically can control communication. Um, so let me go back, sorry, flipping around here, but it's very important to get a sense of uh, where things are. So here is the first British landing. And this is Throg's Neck or Frog's Neck, it was, as it was called then. Um, and it should have two Gs here, but the, the second G was dropped. Um, so this is the British landing in uh, seven, in, uh, October, uh, 12th of 1776. Um, so the British land, um, but they didn't take into account that they would have to um, cross the, this tidal marsh. The, the, the land there is very marshy and they had put down planks to cross into, uh, to land at Throg's Neck. Um, but Washington kind of, kind of saw this coming and had put um, Edward Hand from Pennsylvania and his riflemen into position there. And they rip out the planks and fire on on uh, Howe's troops, and they have to beat a retreat. And they had tried this several times, this kind of encircling, uh, th this encircling tactic to destroy Washington's army. Um, but the second time is, is a bit of a, a, a great, um, very, very interesting in what, um, what happens. Um, so General Howe is moving his army further north 
and he lands about 4,000 British troops uh, at Pellis Point in what is today Pelham Bay Park. Um, and John Glover, who was uh, a colonel from Marblehead, Massachusetts, was stationed here in what was called East Chester then, just north of Pell's Point. Um, and he was, he was sent there to, be, to keep a watch to look for any British landings. And he saw them coming, landing at Pell's Point. Um, and so he quickly went down there with, he only had 750 men. He was outmatched you know, quite significantly as the British had almost 4,000 troops. And he took up position on the Split Rock Road. And this was a road with, with um, with uh, stone walls on either side. And he stationed his troops on either side of the wall in one, uh, one battalion in the rear um, behind another stone wall. And first uh, from one side of the road, the troops would rise up, fire, and then retreat. And then the British would think they were okay to continue, to, you know, to, to continue moving. And then from the other side of the road, the troops would fire. And it made the British think that they were vastly outnumbered. And it stops, it stops the British army and it allows Washington to escape with his, with his army um, to the mainland and to White Plains. Um, and then the Battle of White Plains takes place on October 28th. Uh, and from there, Washington retreats into New Jersey. So really the series of the battles in New York is really a series of ret retreats. But again, it's uh, kind of like the Dunkirk of the American Revolution. Hell's Point, so very much like the Battle of Brooklyn or the Battle of Long Island, and that had the army been, had the Continental Army been trapped there, the war would have uh, ended at that, at that point. So here's a map of Pelham Bay Park uh, uh, today, and this is where uh, the landing took place. So I'll show you the landing in the original map. So it's, it's right, right down here right where East Chester Bay is. Um, um, and here we have, this is the Shore Road here, and this is the Orchard Beach Road. And Pelham Bay is an enormous area. It was the estate of the Pell family. And it's, it's almost 3,000 acres. It's the largest park in New York City. And here is, uh, I don't know if you can read it, the print isn't good. It says Glover's Rock, and this commemorates uh, where John Glover's troops fired on the British and you know, thereby saving the Continental Army. But really it took place further, further north here, the, the battle. So the rock is a bit, a, a bit poorly placed. So after, after this retreat, um, if you were a farmer living in the Bronx at this time, your life becomes very difficult. Um, the British occupy all of what is all, all of New York City and all of what is today the southern por portion of the Bronx, um, and the and the Americans have positions you know further north. But between this red line and this black dotted line down here, what was what is what was called the neutral ground, meaning that um, no no one uh, side really controlled it. I mean, it's the North Bronx is occupied by the British and the Hessians. But it's really kind of it, it, it changes hands a, a number of times during the war, um, and you also have, as a result of this kind of absence of authority in, the, in what's called the neutral ground, you have these marauding bands, each committing de depredations. Um, uh, the cowboys uh, were, the, were the British sympathizers, and they were called the cowboys because of all the cattle they stole and livestock from farmers, and then gave it to the British army. And the American, uh, I guess you would call them guerrilla fighters, were called the Skinners because they would take the skin uh, off your back if they could. And they were also involved in stealing livestock from farmers and particularly from Tory farmers and giving it to uh, colonial troops. But again, there's this great Washington Irving um, quote that where he says, that, you know, how do they know the, the politics of the cow? So, so really it became, it became kind of indiscriminate on both sides. Um, but as you can see, it was kind of a very large area. And one of the most notable of the Tory uh, raiders was called James Delancey. And he was a member of that family that had the large estate and what is today Bronx Park where the Bronx Zoo and the New York Botanical Garden is. 
um, and his his uh, his his uh, marauding kind of band was called the, the Light Horse, the, the the Westchester Light Horse Brigade. He was involved in many uh, kind of depredations, and also uh, Robert Rogers, um, Rogers Rangers, was also another guerrilla fighter at this time that was loyal loyal to the loyal to the crown and stole cattle for uh, the British. Uh, here is the statue of, uh, of John Glover. He was a colonel at this time. Um, after the Battle of Pell's Point, Washington, Washington offers him a promotion to Brigadier General, but he turns it down and for a time is kind of not, not involved with the army, but then later fights again and is promoted to Brigadier General. And this is in Boston, um, uh, the Commonwealth Avenue, a park on, on Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, here's the Admiral Howe, the great uh, naval commander for the British Army. Um, and he, he, as I say, he and his brother had tried to encircle Washington a number of times. Um, and the British kind of relied, the, relied very much on their naval superiority. Um, but of course, the, the Americans, the knowledge of the train helped, helped greatly uh, during the revolution. Um, so the British take the forts that were along the Harlem River. They're occupied by Hessian troops. Um, and they were headquartered, the Hessians were headquartered at Fort Number 8. And this is today south of the Bronx Hall of Fame of Great Americans uh, by the new Bronx Community College. Um, and many uh, farmers leave following, the, they follow the Americans and retreat. Uh, so this choice becomes very difficult for many uh, Bronx farmers. And I wanted to emphasize in this lecture kind of the experience of uh, ordinary people that uh, may, may, like had perhaps served in a militia, but were essentially neutral during the war. They, like, they just wanted to get on with their business with farming, or if they were a blacksmith or a butcher, they just kind of wanted to get on with their business and make money and not be so uh, disrupted by the consequences of the war. Um, but some people stay in, in their uh, in their in their farmhouses, despite the occupation by the British and the Hessians. Uh, here's Glover's Rock, as I mentioned, uh, in the middle of Pelham Bay Park along Shore Road. Though the battle takes place, uh, about Pell's Point takes place further north, on Split Rock Road. And here's uh, Glover's Rock, the dedication, 1960, 1960. And these are uh, some of the founding members of the uh, Bronx County Historical Society. Here is a, uh, a photograph of the Ferris House that sadly was destroyed. And this was on um, the headquarters in 1776 uh, for Lord Howe when he was staying at uh, Throg's Neck. Um, and, the, and the house was the home of James and Charity Ferris, who were a prominent uh, Bronx family of farmers and, and, and merchants. Um, and they were loyal, they were, they were revolutionaries. And Charity Ferris had a slave that she would send to uh, to Lord Howe um, to wait to you know to 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 wait on him, and he would talk with his troops, and he would talk very freely because he didn't think that the slave would understand what he was saying, um, and the slave was bringing every bringing all the information he heard back to Charity Ferris, and Charity Fa Charity uh, Ferris. Uh, and th then gave the information to Washington, who was in White Plains. Um, and Lord Howe was always surprised that you know Washington knew his next move. Um, but sadly, the house was uh, destroyed as a result of uh, development in uh, in New York City. And it was um, it was in uh, if we can not go back for a minute and show you. It was in right here, Westchester Village, or what is today, Westchester Square. And here's another photograph of the, the Ferris House. So here's a map of uh, Norwood uh, from the Revolution. And this was a part of the northern strip of the neutral ground, where I said that the air was occupied several times. 
by British, Hessian, and, uh, and American troops. Um, and you can see here, you can see here, uh, this is East Gun Hill Road up here. Today, this is a park, it was once a rest for. Um, and during the, the Continental Congress recommended 1775, 1776, um, to bring all the cannons up from the battery because they, they expected the city to be captured by the British to bring it up here um, along what was the old Boston Post Road. And so that road after, after that was then called Cannon Hill Road or Gun Hill Road. And it also features in a, a, a battle um, in 1777, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but there's a strange, um, a, a, a strange thing, there's an old, very old record from the 1740s where this, uh, this area was called Gun Hill and it, you know, very odd because the only, the only thing I've ever read for the, for the origin of the name is that it was because of, that they brought the cannon from the battery and stored it there. And this, and, and Gun, Hill Road, Gun Hill Road today runs all the way from uh, the Marshall Parkway over to the Hutchinson River, uh, which is a you know, very long distance. But in the revolution, the, the, it would have extended um, where the battles were fought from about Jerome Avenue and to the Williams Bridge, um, where the Gun Hill Road, where Gun Hill Road goes over the Bronx River. And that bridge is called the Williams Bridge because John Williams was a landowner there at the, at the, during the revolution. Um, so here is uh, photographs of the Valentine Varian House, which was built in 1758, making it the second oldest house in the Bronx. Uh, it's located on Bainbridge Avenue in the Bronx. Uh, and it's named for the two farming families who lived in the house. And it's very illustrative of the lives of ordinary Americans. So during the revolution, Isaac Valentine was a blacksmith and a farmer. Uh, and he was very, uh, he was very successful because of the location of his farmhouse right next to the Boston Post Road and the Albany Post Road, where he could you know, sell various tools to people and fix, fix horseshoes and fix carriages and carriage wheels and various things. He was also a very successful farmer. About three, uh, his farm was about 300 acres. Uh, and he's caught, up in the, he's caught up in the revolution. His house is occupied uh, by the British and the Hessians. Uh, and by the Americans, particularly close, closer to the end of the war. And the Valentine Varian House, this is its original location. Uh, it's moved across Bainbridge Avenue in 1965. And Valentine is very interesting in that he serves, they all, he serves in the militia, but he's essentially neutral. He only takes, he only takes part in one little skirmish during the war. Um, and he's also falsely accused of spiking the cannon uh, that were brought up uh, along what's a Gun Hill Road, um, you know, rendering them, rendering them inoperable. Uh, but it was later found out that he was, uh, you know, falsely accused and that it conspired that it was two Tories from uh, Mamaroneck uh, that, had, that had done the, the terrible deed. And so this area at the time, it becomes kind of this neutral ground, it becomes this like low level. There are these various um, skirmishes fought and a, a few big battles, but the, the area becomes very precarious and very much ruined and ravaged as a result of the war. So here is uh, Robert Rogers, Rogers Rangers. And he was loyal to the, to the crown, to the he was a Tory. Um, and he gained notoriety as a guerrilla fighter. And he, 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 the farmers loathed him because of all the cattle he stole um, for the British. And he occupies Isaac Valentine's stone farmhouse in 1777. He had gained fame um, as a fighter um, in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, for being this kind of backwoodsman fighter who refused to wear the traditional uniform of the British. He wore green, which obviously made more sense, particularly fighting in, a, in the in a very wooded kind of pastoral area. And one of, the, one of the main things that Washington wanted to do was to take back, obviously, the forts to regain control of, of Kingsbridge. Um, and this was all a prelude 
um, to a potential invasion of New York City that Washington thought would end the war and knock out the, knock out the British. And obviously they, they needed, the Americans needed the French fleet um, to, to come into New York Harbor to uh, knock out the British Navy because if the, if the British control the harbor with their navy, it's essentially, even if the Americans control the land, they wouldn't hold it for very long. Um, so William Heath was a colonial general, and he, he, lives, he leads a siege of uh, Fort Independence, um, which is located near present-day Sedgwick Avenue in Giles Place. Um, and the thinking behind this uh, uh, invasion by the Americans was that Washington was really kind of embattled in New Jersey. And it wasn't so much that he thought William Heath could take the Kings Ridge back and all the forts back, but that he wanted the, the British to kind of divide their army in New Jersey and he wanted the British to send more troops to New York so that he would, that Washington would have a freer hand in New Jersey. So he's ordered by Washington to attack the Harlem River Force in 1777. Um, the siege is ultimately unsuccessful. They come down in three columns um, from the north, one, from, one down the Boston Post Road, uh, another down closer to um, the Miles Square Road, which is today uh, close to uh, Gun Hill Road, um, and down uh, through the Albany Post Road. Um, and they, 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 they lead the siege, but unfortunately the, there's a terrible rainstorm and their gunpowder is uh, rendered useless. Um, but they do fire, they do fire a cannon on the, on the fort and on the British from uh, a, from what is today Williamsbridge Reservoir Oval Park, just by just south of Gun Hill Road. So Gun Hill Road kind of owes its name to the, to the two things: the bring the bring the cannon from the battery and uh, and firing on the British during this abortive siege, which, which doesn't work out. Um, but but again, there's this there's this constant there's this constant kind of ploy by Washington to try to gain control, regain control of New York City. And the first step with that was controlling the approach to the mainland so to, to be able to bring the troops in. Uh, here's another map of the revolutionary forts. Um, and th this is interesting because it's, it, it imposes the forts um, on the modern road scheme of the Bronx. So here's the Valentine Baron House down here. Uh, here's a Negro fort uh, on the Grand Con along the Grand Concourse in Van Cortlandt Avenue East. And Van Cortlandt Avenue East is a remnant of, it was originally an Indian trail as many of these roads are. Um, and it's originally part of the old Boston Post Road. Um, and where the old Kings Bridge, the actual bridge was, um, is just like a block from Broadway um, but Marble Hill Avenue, if you're familiar, if, if any of you are familiar with the area, that's, that's, the, that, that's where the Kingsbridge would have ran from Marble, from Inwood to Marble Hill. So here we see Fort Independence to the north here where the siege is, is led. And of course the reservoir wasn't there at the time and all the Marshall Parkways. Those are all 19, uh, 19th and 20th century place names. So here's another major general, Israel Putnam. Excuse me. Um, he he commands he, he commanded the American troops in Bainbridge or what is Norwood, um, and he leads an attack on Kingsbridge in 1777, um, and th that again was to try to um, the British had pulled back from some of the forts along the Harlem River um, because they didn't think it was worthwhile enough to try to keep them anymore because the Americans were so weak there, um, but. Again, this is, it's another kind of, this wouldn't even really qualify as a battle, it's more of a skirmish. skirmish. Um, and, but Valentine's farm again serves as a battlefield. So he's kind of being, and, you know, occupied by troops. Here is a modern day Gun Hill Road. Um, and this is the, the Williams Bridge. Um, and just, just over here to, is where the, the Americans fired on the British with their cannon. Um, as I said, it's named for the, for the uh, and this is, a, this is an older photograph, and the Bronx River Parkway runs right beneath the bridge. Um, and obviously that's the, it's, it's just over the river as well. 
So another famous family, um, there was a, there was a large uh, merchant family, uh, had a large estate in what is today Van Cortlandt Park, another huge city park, about 1,500 acres. Um, it's the oldest house in the Bronx. It's built in 1748. Um, and there, as a family more pro-revolutionary, um, Augustus Van Cortlandt hides the city records. He was the clerk of the city of New York. He hides them in his uh, father's burial, uh, burial site uh, in the north of the house, uh, Frederick Van Cortlandt, which is called Vault Hill. And as a result, the British never find them for the duration of the war, you know, greatly hindering their efforts to, um, to uh, complete, completely wipe out the American army. And it's, this is a very strategic location as well. It's, it's located just north of uh, the Kingsbridge um, and what is today Broadway and the Albany and what would have been the Albany Post Road then. Um, and Washington, um, this, this is occupied by the British. And Washington also uses this brief, not briefly as like a, as a headquarters during the grand uh, reconnaissance of 1781, where he was, he wanted to kind of suss out the, the British positions in Manhattan to see where they were weak, because he was seriously contemplating an invasion to, of New York City to end the war. And it wasn't until uh, Cornwallis, the British General Cornwallis and his army was were trapped in Yorktown in Virginia uh, that Washington decides to, um, to, to, invade, to invade there. Um, but there's a legend that he keeps, he keeps fires burning. Washington keeps fires burning in Van Cortlandt Park um, just, before the just before the Battle of Yorktown to, uh, as a diversion for the, for the British. Uh, and what is the area is also interesting um, in what is today Van Cortlandt Park and what was then the Van Cortlandt Estate. And the Van Cortlands were merchants. They had a sawmill, a wheat mill, a sawmill, and very, very, very wealthy. Um, but as I say, there's like these kind of inconclusive skirmishes between 1776 and 1781 before the end of the war in the Bronx. And one of these is um, there's a, a group of Stockbridge Indians that were loyal to the, to the Americans, to the colonial cause. Um, that are ambushed by the, by the British in what is today Van Cortlandt Park East, by Woodlawn Cemetery, and they take flight and run uh, towards, River, towards Riverdale. They run west and they're, they're massacred there. Uh, and that area has been called the Indian Field ever since. Uh, so here is uh, Rochambeau, who was the French commander of all, of all the French forces in America. Uh, and he fights with with uh, with Washington near uh, near the end of the war, and he's very instrumental in the grand uh, in kind of steering Washington's thinking uh, away from New York City um, and towards Virginia. But during the grand reconnaissance, um, Rochambeau and Washington are going down, and they going down way into the Bronx, into the South Bronx, into Morrisania, um, so they can observe the 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 British positions in Manhattan um, across the Harlem River. And he's Washington, Washington and Rochambeau um, use a guide by the name of Andrew Corsa, who was from Fordham, um, who knew the area very well. And there's a story that they were under fire. There were all these skirmishes as they moved down with their army. Um, no, no significant battles, but you know, but they're you know coming under fire. And Andrew Corsa's Andrew Corsa goes to hide. And Washington and Rochambeau are just on their horses, looking, you know, looking, uh, looking at the looking at the position of the forts across the Harlem River. Um, and so, of course, uh, the idea was uh, at the beginning of the war, the British had the idea that you know, if you if you were master of, of of all of New York City, you could also be able to move your army up very easily into the Hudson Valley and to cut off the American troops that way. Um, and he near the near the end of the of the grand reconnaissance, he supposedly sleeps um, in the Valentine Varian house, and he refers to it as a as a wretched farmhouse. I suppose after uh, Versailles, everything is uh, second uh, second second best. Um, so after the war, let me go back to the let me go back to the beginning here. 
So after the war, this kind of this great um, division of the states, all the Tory, all the huge Tory estates, and this would include Delancey, uh, the Phillipses in Spite and Dival, um, they're all confiscated by the crown. Um, uh, pardon me, confiscated by the uh, by, by, by the new um, American government and given given to farmers. But the land here is is, is really ravaged. Um, and Isaac Valentine again is a good. It's very emblematic of these trends. Um, he he loses his farm and goes to to Yonkers. Um, the the land was ravaged. And there's also what's erroneous called, erroneously called the Hessian fly that destroys the wheat crop after the war. Um, it didn't come from, from Hess, which is a German state where the Hessians came from. Um, but regardless, the, the, the wheat crop was destroyed um, after the war. And there's a lot of uh, economic depression as well soon after the war. Um, but, But the Bronx is very, is, is very kind of significant, uh, and I think I think not talked about as much as it as it, as it should be, particularly with Pell's Point uh, and kind of holding the line. Like you hear about the Battle of Brooklyn, the Battle of Long Island, much more frequently, I think, than you would about um, the Battle of the Battle the Battles in, Bro in the Bronx. And so that that's the that's the talk. I hope you I hope you learn something, and I hope you have questions for me. Thank you so much. That was interesting. Uh, as you said, we don't, we don't really hear about um, things happening very far north of the uh, lower Manhattan in the revolution. So it's nice to hear about different things that were going on in New York City. I'm now going to turn it over to Ali to moderate our Q&A. I see we've got a lot of questions submitted. Um, we won't have time for all of them, but we'll get through as many as possible. Well, how long did I go, by the way? I tried to keep it tight. Oh, no, you were good. You were right on. Okay, good. Right on, right on point. Um, so, Ali, you can take it away. Great. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. And we do have lots of great questions. So the first one um, actually is about the Battle of Pell's Point. Um, how many soldiers participated on each side? How many were wounded or killed? And how long do we think it lasted? It's about 4,000 uh, British soldiers, uh, 750 about 750 American soldiers. Um, it lasts, I would say, lasts for a few days, but really the halt, the, the, the key thing is that the, the British Army halts as a result. Great. Um, here's another question about battles. Did any Revolutionary War battles take place in the area around Woodlawn Cemetery? Uh, the, the, the Siege of Fort Independence, um, it takes place, um, if you can see here, uh, the Williams Bridge, which is just, just, um, just south of, uh, uh, just east and south of, of Woodlawn Cemetery. Uh, and and the, the Americans come under fire during that siege and retreat into uh, what is now Woodlawn Cemetery and fire back at the British, but no, no major battle. Um, though though the, 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 the Stockbridge Indian Massacre happens, um, well, they ambush them close to what is now Woodlawn Cemetery, but, but by Van Cortlandt Park East and Woodlawn Cemetery. Great. Um, our next question is about the Delancey family. Uh, you meant you talked about them a bit. Is this the same Delanceys as the Delanceys brigade that stayed in Oyster Bay in the winter of 76, 77? I'm not certain. I'm sorry to say. Um, it, it could very well be. Were they, were they Tories? Were they fighting for the British? Oh, I, that's, that's all the context I have. Um, Christopher says, yes, they were Tories. It could be, it could be. I'd have to check that. I'm not certain. I'm sorry to say. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, someone else says, uh, great map. 
uh, referring to the one that's up on the screen now. Um, can you tell us uh, the source of it or could we get an electronic copy of it? Yeah, I can send you a copy. It's from, um, it's from 1926 from Otto Heuflin, um, his History of uh, Westchester County. Okay, great. Um, why I, don't I, I have you... to, I have I have other maps as well where it's um, it's also it's more interesting in that um, it, it's like the old places but superimposed on the mo the modern map. It's very kind of cool to look at. Why don't you send us uh, links to those and we can include it um, in our follow up email um, with the recording to this lecture. Okay, I right, sure that do. Would be great. Thank you. Um, Let's see, what else do we have going on? What was the socioeconomic makeup of the Bronx at the time of the revolution? Um, it was mostly um, uh, farmers, merchants, uh, well, pretty, if you're, if, you're, if you're white and you're a man, it was a fairly egalitarian, but most of these people are slave owners. I mean, Cortland's own, own a number of slaves and even the smaller farmers like Isaac Valentine owned slaves. And uh, I think I think Valentine's one of only like 800 people, 800 people in New York State that paid taxes, which is you know, incredible. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's it's pretty, pretty like large estates, some smaller farms, but mostly agricultural. Like, um, some very commercial as well, but the Bronx more, uh, more, uh, more rural. But as I say, because of its location next to these roads, um, it's a very lucrative market, like Hunts Point today, perhaps you could say. Okay, fabulous. And what was the makeup between um, loyalists and uh, people that supported the fight for independence? I think it's more if you count. I think it, I think it more I would say more Tory than revolutionary, unfortunately. Interesting. Um, was there any kind of religious divide? Um, yeah, I mean, there would be. Yeah, there, there um, Samuel Seabury, who writes um, various pamphlets uh, supporting the, 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 the British, the British argument. Um, and he, he's then a he's then there's an argument, a pamphlet war with him and Hamilton. But he was, I, I believe, an Anglican uh, Church of England. Um, and so, so he was loyal, you know, to the crown for that reason. Um, and again, it's, it's, I, I don't know if there, there might have been like a sectarian thing with Baptist and Methodist, but I'm not as, I'm not as certain of that. And I think, I think what you have more of in, in what is now the Bronx is, uh, people just kind of want to make money and be left alone. Um, and they viewed it as a, you know, as a, as a, as a very annoying to have to, you know, have your have have your livelihood destroyed. They didn't didn't really care either way which way it went. Okay, uh, this next question is a bit geographical. Yes. Um, was Kingsbridge where Broadway crosses between Manhattan and the Bronx? It's it's I think it, it very close. I think just a block west, which would be Marble Avenue, uh, but very close to Broadway. Yes. Awesome. Um, this is also geographical. What was Washington's route from the Bronx up to White Plains? Um, up the, uh, oh, right here we have it. Road right above the, uh, the Williams Bridge here. Oh no, pardon me. He would have gone up, um, he would have gone up uh, probably the Boston Post Road and cut over and gone up through here. Okay, um, this is a question about um, Glover's army. Didn't uh, this person wants to know if it contained both Native Americans and freed uh, enslaved people? I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not certain. I, I know he was. It was composed of the, the Marbleheaders from from Massachusetts, and he was from Salem originally. It could. It, it, I'm, I'm sure. I know they use they use Indians as, as guides. Um, I don't know the answer to if it if it included, um, but Massachusetts. I mean that that would make sense. But I'm not. I'm not certain. I'm sorry to say. I'd have to look that up. Okay. 
Um, can you talk a little bit more about the Cowboys and the Skinners that you mentioned? Oh yeah, so, the, so um, there were these essentially like bands of these guerrilla fighters. Uh, the Cowboys were the, the, the fighters that were loyal to the, to the British and they would basically just steal cattle and steal food and livestock and you know, vegetables and produce and use it for themselves and for the, the British and give it to the British army. And the Skinners were the American equivalent that would kind of fight. It was like a civil war, really, between the, the two people that were loyal to the crown and people that were uh, loyal to uh, the colonial the colonial cause. And it becomes, as I say, it becomes this, you know, it becomes indiscri kind of indiscriminate in some cases. And that's why the so many farmers lost their uh, lost their farms after, after the war. Great. Um, did Robert Rogers ever offer his services to Washington or was he strictly for the British? I don't know. I think he, I would say he was strictly for the British. I've never heard, you know, I know for Washington it's, you know, famously turned down by the, by the British. And you imagine how history would have turned out then. But I don't know about Robert Rogers. I know there's an interesting book called um, Crucible of War um, about the Seven Years' War. Uh, by Fred Anderson, and he, he's very critical of Robert Rogers in that book. He's, he, the basic argument is he was kind of like a braggart and that his exploits didn't really match up with you know, how he talked about them, that he, his, his bark was bigger than his bite. Um, but he was you know, very, he, he gained a terrible reputation, but he had a reputation in the Seven Years' War as this kind of brilliant, brilliant backs woodsman and guerrilla fighter. Um, and then in the, in the, in the, in the, during the revolution, he uh, really gains the antipathy of a lot of farmers for his his uh, his marauding ways and the depredations really of stealing cattle and requisitioning food. Okay, great. Um, also, speaking of uh, Robert Rogers, um, this person thinks they might have spotted a Native American depicted in the background of his portrait. Do you think that has any significance, or if he had any influence or relationship with any of these? Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I would say that the significance is that he's that he would have said he was fighting like in the, in the style of the, of the Native Americans, kind of the you know the, the, the guerrilla warfare, the kind of backwoods. If you know if you know the terrain, you have an advantage, and not not doing the traditional where the, the, the you know the, the 18th century warfare where the battles meet and pitch battle. <laughs> In different colors as well, in the case anyone's confused. Um, but really, you know, it makes it makes more sense, particularly particularly in an area like the Bronx, where it's where the, the topography is. If you know the land is ideal, um, these you know rolling hills and you know just a tremendous area if you, if you if you're familiar with it in warfare. Okay, great. Um... Let's see what else we have here. Um, this person would like to confirm that you mentioned that Isaac Valentine moved to Yonkers after the revolution. Did he connect with other family members that were already there because they believe some Valentines were already in Yonkers? Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a very prominent, very prominent um, D Dutch, and, and it's a Dutch name um, and they're very prominent in the Bronx and yes, yeah, he did. and. They, they 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 still farmed his descendants farm in, in in different areas in the Bronx you know after for, for centuries um uh, when Edgar Allan Poe lives in Fordham his, he rents a, a he rents a cottage from the from the Valentine family that was a that was a farmhouse and the Bronx that in the Bronx is still pretty rural then you know hundred uh, almost a hundred years later so it's not really until the the end of the nineteenth the turn of the twentieth century you start to see the urban Bronx. And it doesn't become the West Bronx, west of the river, doesn't become part of the, doesn't become part of New York City until 1874. And the East Bronx, east of the river, becomes part of New York City in 1895. Um, and then in 1898, when the Greater New York City is created, that's when the borough of the Bronx is, is made. Okay. Um, do we know if Washington had any spies up in the Bronx? Uh, the, the the Ferrises, I mean, the, the, they were kind of spies for him. I think Howe thought they were 
um, they were loyal to the to the crown. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I think I, I think you know, in a, a number of spies um, on both sides during the revolution. Okay. Um, it is reported that if Glover had not stopped the British at Pell's Point, that they would have cut Washington off. Is that true? Yes, I, I think it, I think it is true. Um, it was the, the 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 disparity in the forces was so great, um, and the British had such a naval advantage and a, and a troop number advantage that it would have been very easy had they controlled the King's Bridge and had what you know. So, so the Kings were just here, and Washington's army is 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 in you know upper upper Manhattan and Harlem over here. So, so if the British had been able to move in there before Washington escaped, I, th I think that's yeah, that's true that the, that the war would have ended in 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 the, in the favor of the British, perhaps. Though again, you can never really know; it's a counterfactual. But I think it's I think it's likely. Okay. Um... You talked about two uh, historic houses up in the Bronx. What happened to them after the war? Did people continue to live there? Yes, the the Van Cortlandt house was, um, the Van Cortlandt still lived there and it's still a museum today. Um, and it, it, it's a museum today. Um, and the, the Valentine house is called a Valentine Varian house because Isaac Varian, who's a butcher and a, and a farmer, buys the farm from Isaac Valentine in 1792 and farms it for a century. And then it becomes, it gets, when, it, when the Bronx is more urbanized, it goes to a private private owner. Um, what, what other houses did I mention? The Ferris home is, is, was destroyed. Um, I think, I, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if, if people lived there after, uh, I, I'm sure they did, but I'm not sure if it was, it was ever a museum, the Ferris House. I'm not, I'm not certain of that, unfortunately. Okay. Um, how populated was the Bronx um, at the time of the revolution and when did it start becoming more urban? Um, it was sparsely populated, I would say probably, probably not even in the thousands. And it's really the, I mean, the 18th century is very, you know, very sparsely populated because it's all, it's all farmland. Um, and I think the statistic is, I think it's like in like the early 19th century, um, I don't know the exact figure, but it goes from like, goes from 100,000 to almost a million people if by the beginning and the end of the 19th century, um, because New York City was expanding so much. And you also have people coming over from uh, this huge wave of immigration from Europe. Um, it's America is becoming industrialized at the end of the 19th century, uh, building building all these things, um, trains, uh, and you have also not just from Europe, from the Irish, the Germans, and it, Italians and Jews as well became become very prominent in the Bronx. Um, but you also have an internal migration in the, from the American South of, uh, of African Americans living in the South after Jim Crow ends. Uh, that settle, and this is in the 20th century, um, but they settle in the Bronx, really augmenting the population. But it's really the kind of the, the opening of, of industrial capitalism at the end of the 19th century and the 20th century, and all the people that you need to uh, kind of make an urban civilization. That's when the Bronx really explodes in population. And the Bronx River, um, it was, uh, you know, extremely beautiful in the 18th and 19th century. And, Edgar Allan Poe talks about when he lived there, he talks about walking and it's like this luxuriant growth and of trees and forestry. And by the end of the 19th century, there's 200 factories along the Bronx River. Um, so, but the pendulum now is turned. It's, it's not so bad today, but you know, it, it, in the, at the early 20th century, the end of the 19th century, it's, it's, uh, it, it's getting very citified for sure. Okay, that's a good segue into our next question. Um, was there any significant shipping or port activity in the Bronx uh, during the Revolutionary Era? Uh, I think I think I think uh, Manhattan would have monopolized most of it, um, and 
yeah, Manhattan, I think, would have monopolized most, but there was, there, I'm sure there was, there was commerce of that kind, but not to a great extent. And most of the traffic on, uh, of this area, why it's a good, uh, good location, was, it was a good location in the 18th century, was that um, it was like horse, horse carriages, uh, you know, delivering, delivering food and letters and things of that nature. So, the, and of course, it's not, it's not really until the, the Erie Canal opens up. That you, that's another reason why the population increases so much that New York City becomes the first stop um, of, of goods for the rest of the country because it's, it's, it was cheaper to ship it from New York than anywhere else. And before the Erie Canal, the cost of you know, bringing something west, um, it, it took, you know, because, because there was no, um, because it wasn't waterborne, you had to bring it over mountains. Uh, you had to bring goods over, it took, and it took an inordinate amount of time. So it's not until later that you have um, kind of the more, uh, the more commercial, more commercial activity. Though, though there was a significant amount in the 18th century as well. Okay, great. Um, I've had several people ask this question. Who named the Bronx? Uh, it's named for Jonas Bronck, B-R-O-N-C-K, um, who was the first European settler uh, to what we now call the Bronx after him. He came here in 1639. He was given uh, farmland uh, down here in what is now Ma Haven. Uh, and this is, it was Morrisania then, but it was, what is say, Mahaven in the South Bronx. Like he was given a farm by the Dutch East India Company. Um, and the river is named after him. And he was a Swedish, uh, he was a Swede, uh, a merchant. He had been living in the Netherlands uh, and he came over um, and was a kind of a very erudite man. And he's also instrumental in mediating, mediating a treaty uh, between the Dutch government um, at the time, and the and the Native Americans, it was a particularly nasty uh, Dutch governor of New York. Um, it was kind of fomenting these uh, these attacks, these these, uh, these attacks on Indians, and he and, and then the, the Indians, of course, would attack them. And Braun kind of steps in and mediates this, this treaty. Um, and then the river is named after him, and that's why it's the Bronx and not just Bronx, the Bronx River. Okay, and this is going to be my last question as we're just about out of time. If you could dine with anyone at France's Tavern, uh, dead or alive, who would you choose? Dead or alive, I guess the cliche is to say Washington, so I don't want to say that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say, I'll say Governor Morris, the kind of uh, neglected founding father, very witty and very kind of very kind of uh, cynical in his view of human nature, anti-slavery. Um, and his, his, his diaries are so funny. You read them, you're like laughing out loud. Um, but he's, he's, he's very nasty though. He wouldn't help Thomas Paine when he was the, when Governor Morris was the minister to France, when Thomas Paine had got in over his head during the terror, it was almost guillotined. He refused to intervene because they had political differences. <laughs> But any of the Morrises I would have liked to have dined with. I think that's a good answer. Um, Governor Morris is probably on my like top five if I was picking for that. Um, okay. thank, thank you, Roger, uh, for that wonderful lecture and all that information. Thank you, Allie, for moderating our Q&A. And thank you to all of you at home for joining us tonight. If you enjoyed tonight's lecture and would like to stay up to date with all of our programs, you can join our mailing list by going to francistavernmuseum.org. There you will also find our social media accounts as well as a calendar of upcoming programs. Our next lecture is not going to be until April. It'll be on April 7th. Thank you to those of you who have donated to the museum. Your generous support helps us fulfill our mission and share the history of the American Revolutionary Era with the public. If you would like to make a donation, you can also do that on our website. Again, that's francistavernmuseum.org. So thank you again for joining us at another Francis Tavern Museum lecture and we hope to see you again soon.